I like to say it. Merry Christmas! That's what I really want for myself and for you. That you may be merry. A cheerful time of rejoicing in Jesus at the end of the year. Merry Christmas. Merry was merry. M A R Y was M E R R Y. And it wasn't because her situation was ideal. It wasn't because her nation was on top. Even her religion was led by legalistic people of no shepherd heart. Yet she said, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary was Mary. Like Mary, we too can have the joy of Jesus coming this Christmas time and can be filled to bursting. We can engage God's calling on our lives with joy like Mary. We can know him as God, my Savior. But it does not begin at a shopping mall or under a tree. It all begins when we really hear and believe God's word. When we believe God's word, we come to meet God, my Savior. So, do you want to be merry, merry this Christmas? Or just melancholy, the sister of bro Kali? No, we want to be merry, merry. So we have to humble ourselves and learn from a teenager. Can we be humble enough to learn from teenage Mary? Let's try. First, blessed is she who has believed the Lord. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now, I wonder where Mary got the idea to travel all the way to Zechariah's house. In the last passage, she had been told that she would conceive and give birth to a son, even though she was a young virgin. The angel Gabriel had explained to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the, Ch- the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Now when you look at people of faith, what reveals their faith? There's a saying, it's not just what we say, but what we, but what we do. Mary's faith and confidence in God's word is revealed by her actions. She heard the message of God through Gabriel concerning Elizabeth and made a decision of faith based on that word that she heard. But she didn't procrastinate. She got ready and hurried by herself the long distance to Zechariah's house. Now God himself was waiting there to receive her. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. All mothers know that feeling of the baby leaping in the womb. I don't know if they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, though. Because this baby was special. He was John the Baptist. And even before he was born, he was preparing the way for the Lord Jesus. He took his mission and calling very seriously. In this way, God himself brought Mary, a young teenage girl with a great responsibility, all the way to seasoned Elizabeth, an elderly righteous woman from a priestly line. Mary's decision of faith was supported. It was enabled and strengthened by God himself at work. 
Now let's look at the other side, Elizabeth. Now she must have been pretty surprised to see Mary. Mary didn't phone ahead. She just showed up one day. Teenage runaway at the door. And now if you put yourself in Elizabeth's shoes, exciting things were going on at Zechariah's house. God was working mightily. Now Elizabeth, she had grown old without any children. She had served the Lord faithfully with her aging husband, Zechariah. Now, God had shown her favor and taken away her disgrace. She was six months pregnant with the forerunner of the Messiah. With this going on, it would be very easy to dismiss Mary or to just understand Mary and draft her into what God was doing in Elizabeth's own life. Oh, thank God. Mary, you're here. God knew I needed help because I'm about to have a baby, so you're here to serve me. Wonderful. <laughs> but that isn't what Elizabeth said at all. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave her inspiration to see this young teenage girl very differently. Verses 42 and 43 read, In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that, what the, that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Seeing past her own situation, Elizabeth realized what God was doing in Mary's life. She was happy for the privilege to welcome the mother of her Lord. Elizabeth's Christ-centered life and attitude became a refuge for Mary so she could find shelter, protection, wisdom, and guidance in that tumultuous time of her life. There's no hint of jealousy or negativity in Elizabeth's words, only encouragement. In Jesus Christ, we are a holy nation and a royal priesthood. And I think that means we are called to participate in Jesus' ministry of reconciliation and mediation. Jesus is calling people and using people like Mary today. He wants to include them in his purpose to be shepherds or mentors who, are, who will help them. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit like Elizabeth so that we may work together with God and what he is doing. What is God doing in their life? not just my life. How is he calling me to encourage them and to serve them? When we have this insight, we can be a blessing. We can be shepherds and Bible teachers and mentors for our nation. We can have wisdom to know how to help people the best way. Just like Elizabeth here really helped Mary. Now for Mary, hearing these words from Elizabeth would be great confirmation of God's words to her through the angel Gabriel. But they also remind her of something more. This is a great responsibility and a task. It's sobering, it's life-changing, and it's very imposing on her own future and plans. But as life-changing and imposing as it was, Elizabeth says that it was the greatest blessing for her. She need only believe that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Now, she had already decided as the Lord's servant to yield and submit to God's plan, no matter what the cost, if only the word of the Lord might be fulfilled. The angel Gabriel had called her highly favored. And, God, and Gabriel had said to her, no word from God would ever fail. 
God is almighty. We know that. He can do anything he wants. And while that is true, it doesn't necessarily fill us with great joy and encouragement. Because the ability to do something and actually taking responsibility and doing it is two different things. For example, America is able to produce and distribute enough food to end hunger in the world. Even smaller scale, we could easily provide everything that the Syrian refugees need if we just decided to build one less warplane this year. We are able to do so. But will we do it? It is very unlikely. But that's the beauty of the word of God. Because God is able to do anything and he tells us what he is going to do through his word. It is his promise. And God never lies. What he says he will do, he is able to do. And what he says he will do is his promise he will do it. Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Amen. Through Elizabeth's counsel, Mary's perspective could change. She could see herself as the most blessed woman to have such a promise from God. Mary believed God's promise, and she knew she was the most blessed woman in the world. Blessed. You like that word? I like that word. It's deep and manifold in meaning. The most simple way of understanding it is this. It means to be happy because of the Lord's grace and favor in its many forms. We tend to limit blessings to material prosperity or emotional stirring or experiential knowledge, but blessing is all this and so much more. Like Mary, are you blessed? Last week I had a conversation with a fellow staff member, and he shared many difficulties going on in his life and why he has a lot of reasons not to be so joyful. It was surprising because from my perspective, he really was the most blessed person <laughs> at everything. And it got me thinking about, wow, when I'm complaining about my situation, another person's probably thinking, wow, you're so blessed. What are you talking about? <laughs> perspective. How important it is to have God's perspective on my life, on our life. From God's perspective, I am the most blessed. And yet I struggle with unthankfulness and anxiety, stress, and sometimes regret. Now, sure, I have many reasons. For example, one small thing, Amy gets up every morning at 4 a.m. so she can go to work at, by 5 a.m. She is really great and works very hard. But that means me, who is a night owl, has to wake up early with the boys and take care of them, waking them and dressing them and feeding four young boys. So often I come to my morning responsibilities at the church harried and rushed and anxious, sometimes upset with myself for being a poor father. I have many things and responsibilities to do, and when I look at myself, I'm often disappointed that I didn't do this or do that or do this better. And then when I think what other people's expectations are of me, I become more burdened. But you see the point? It's all the wrong perspective. It misses the most important thing going on in my life. For Mary Elizabeth's point was this. You are blessed to be the mother of my Lord. Believe it. And the realization of this blessing will come. I'm so privileged to be part of the gospel work that Jesus is doing in my generation. My family has been well provided for. We're growing. We have a wonderful task to grow as a holy family for a holy nation. Judah, to grow as a priest of God. Wow. I'm following Jesus, my Savior, who called me to serve even as a preacher and a teacher of his gospel. I'm really so blessed. 
Thank you, Jesus. Perspective is so important. Believing God's view of my life changes everything. So the question, do you want to be blessed? The reality is, you already are. That is the story of Christmas. The good news of great joy, not for one or two people, but for all the people, every one of us. But do you want to feel it in your deep soul? To believe and realize this blessing? We have to accept that this has very little to do with our current circumstances. It has everything to do with what's going on in here, our inner world and perspective. Godly counsel is this. Let's find God's perspective on my life and my world. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. Someone can't just tell you, this is God's perspective. Oh, I never knew that. <laughs> it's a battle. The first step, I think, is it requires us to put God in his rightful place at the center of the universe. Not myself. We have to move out of that place, let God be the center of the universe, and our place in orbit around him. It means as if in a movie, we become the supporting role, and God is the main actor. That's not easy. It takes some intentional thought to fix our thoughts on Jesus. And that's what I saw Mary doing in her song. We find an example of this from teenage Mary. Second, my soul glorifies the Lord. So we said that we can see a person's faith, not just through what they say, but what they do. Like Mary, who got ready and hurried to Elizabeth's house. But like an iceberg, what we do is only the surface. There's a lot more going on in a person's life under the surface that we don't see and can't have any visibility into unless they reveal it to us. What was going on in Mary's inner world? We could guess many things if we put ourselves in her shoes. Teenage pregnant girl. She could be fearful of people's view of her. She could wonder, how am I going to clothe and care for this child? My situation is terrible. What if Joseph runs away? How are we going to eat? But when we read her song, none of that is in there. There's not even one hint of self-pity. Instead, it's totally the opposite. Let's look at verses 46 and 47. Let's read these together. Can we read these? Okay. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary's soul, her spirit, the eternal being, her character, her life, the inner person, was focused on God. She was full of joy and rejoicing in God. She was Mary, Mary. Her soul glorifies the Lord. It's better translated magnifies. My soul magnifies the Lord. I think it means her inner world wanted to reveal, to praise, to give glory, to worship the Lord. Magnify the Lord. Magnifying something doesn't change what it is. It just reveals it. It makes, it's like making something very, very small, like a single-celled organism much, much bigger in our eye so we can understand and study it so much deeply. So we need to get into focus in what Mary saw to share her joy. Joy. Christmas is the time of joy. But it's also a time of hardship. People struggle with finances, Family relationships. I'll never forget the story I read several years ago about 
one young girl whose worst time of year was Christmas because her parents had divorced and remarried and divorced. So everyone was saying, I'll be home for Christmas. But she had no home. Is it dad's home? Is it mom's home? What a struggle. Some of us face disappointments as the year comes to a close. We wanted this or we wanted to do that. Even the weather it gets cold and dismal around Christmas. And I'm thinking of some people in the room, they've lost loved ones. And they have to face Christmas without them this year. So statistically speaking, depression increases at the Christmas time. The state of our world and nation is also not so up. And we can put on smiles, but sometimes the deep content isn't really there. It's no wonder that we often root or transition to some temporary thing to try to find some joy, some event, or some activity. What was the source and object of Mary's joy? How could she rejoice? Mary said, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Instead of peppermint mochas or football, sales and events, let's take time to think about God, my Savior, based on Mary's song. In what way was she rejoicing in God, my Savior? God is my Savior who has been mindful of me. Verses 48 and 49 read, For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mary saw her humble state as a teenage girl in an oppressed nation. She longed to serve God. She called herself the Lord's slave, the Lord's servant. She had identity, but she had no power or influence to do anything about it. She could not decide anything as a teenage girl under her father. She would marry a man not of her choosing. She would live an ordinary life. She knew she was created for more. But what could she do? Her situation was humble. But now, her state was totally changed. She is known as the blessed woman throughout all the world from all generations because she's the mother of God. She could never have imagined this as a young girl. It was God alone, the mighty one, who had done this in her life. Glory to his holy name. God is the mighty one. Has he done great things for us? He has been mindful. God, the Mighty One, thought of little Mary. Another way of translating this is seeing. He has seen the humble state of his servant. God saw and understood Mary. Another meaning of magnify is to take something that's very, very far away and bring it really close so we can see it and understand it. For example, earlier this year, we saw amazing pictures of the surface of Mars. Do you know how far away the surface of Mars is? Anyone? Depending on its orbit, between 50 and 300 million miles. Man, 300 million miles. And yet we got to see the surface of it and realize these, they magnified the surface of Mars to us. We learned there's water there, water on the surface of Mars. 
incredible. Mary's personal testimony brought God, the great and mighty one, the creator of the heavens and the earth, right down into her life in words, in experiences, feelings that mattered to her right where she was. Her soul magnified the Lord, God, my Savior. See, that is why Jesus came as a baby in a manger, because God is mindful of you and mindful of me. He has done mighty things. Has he done mighty things for you? In the Bible, there's another young pregnant woman who realized God sees her. Hagar was a slave in Abraham's house. Due to her mistress Sarah's lack of faith, Hagar was forced to sleep with Abraham and bear a child. When her mistress Sarah mistreated her, Hagar ran away, this Egyptian slave, all alone on, with a baby. There's no one who could understand what was going through Hagar's life. No one saw her, but God did. God visited her in the wilderness. God spoke to her words of clear direction and blessing, his promises to Hagar. So she obeyed him. She called him El Roy. You are the God who sees me. He has been mindful of me. God sees you. He knows what's going on. You are not alone. Let's review God's work in our lives. Isn't he the one who sees you and is mindful of you in many, many ways? Do you have a testimony like Mary? Can you say, God, my Savior, not the Savior, but my Savior? Then we too will realize we are blessed. We'll rejoice in God, my Savior. We can be merry at Christmas time. God is my Savior who is merciful. Merciful. Look at verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Look at, down at verse 55. It mentions also God's mercy on Israel. Moving beyond herself, Mary focuses only on God, especially his great mercy. The bulk of her song isn't really about herself at all. It's focused on God's mercy on people of every generation down to us today. All throughout history, God has maintained a remnant of people. These are people who fear him, who believe his word, who obey him, and his mercy extends to them. His mercy gives us reason to rejoice in him every day. Look at verse 51a. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. God is able to act in history because his arm is mighty. He is not a weak bystander or observer of what's going on. The Bible is full of examples of the mighty arm of the Lord. He used Moses to bring his people out of oppression in Egypt. He parted the Red Sea so that they could cross to the other side. He intervened through Esther when Haman wanted to slaughter all of the Israelite people. Jesus, Jesus' ministry is full of mighty deeds of mercy. You know, Jesus said of his ministry of driving out demons, he said, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, he didn't even say the arm. The arm's not even necessary, just the finger of God. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is the power of God, 
the mighty one. Is God still mighty? You're not sure. The war in Syria is horrible. Is God mighty? You know, God is not absent in this situation. We need eyes to see. We need to magnify what God is doing. There's one church in Berlin. This church had a dwindling membership down to about 150. Some have said the church in Germany is dead. But the pastor there, he began to welcome and serve refugees, Muslim people from Iran, Afghanistan, and Syria. He began to welcome and serve them and teach them the Bible, more than 600 of them weekly, filling his church, reinvigorating all of his members because they were serving the Lord. Now, these were people who were never given the option to hear and believe the gospel when they lived in the Middle East. They had no choice, but they're now baptized. They're set free to worship Jesus. Their spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. What a mercy of God, both to those refugees and also to that church in Germany. Thank God who is working mightily in our world today. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Amen. Look again at verse 51. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. You know, God's power isn't limited just to the physical world. When we hear this verse, it may seem a little bit scary for those of us, especially us, who are a little proud, like me, a little bit scary. But remember, his mercy is shown to those who fear him. Those who fear God, his mercy is extended to. See, those who are proud, God is able to humble. No problem. Thank you, God. Many years ago, I was told, asking God to humble you is one prayer he always answers. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. I learned uh, in many ways. What a mercy that God deals with us in full disclosure. You know, he also knows what's going on in others' lives. We have no idea sometimes. But we don't need to speculate but trust God, who is able to deal with us as we really are. He knows. It's his mercy. Look at the reversals, verses 52 and 53. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. That's human history. It's kingdoms rising and falling, but behind this is God himself ruling and overruling. And God lifts up the humble. Mary is one example, but Jesus is the greatest example. Although he is God, he humbled himself and was born to poor parents in an oppressed nation and laid in a manger. He was wrapped in rags. Yet this sorrowful origin did not make him a victim. He did not live as a victim. He loved and he served, even to the point of laying down his life so that our sins may be forgiven. God exalted this Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. This Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. We serve him. Who's your boss? Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. 
He's our king. And he fills the hungry with good things. True satisfaction and contentment aren't found in material blessings or human relationships or meaningful achievements. Because all of these things, they come and go in our human experience. But those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Those who feed on Jesus will never be hungry again. We find real and true satisfaction in God, my Savior. Amen. Verses 55, 54 and 55 read, He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary saw that this baby growing in her womb was the Messiah of the world, fulfilling God's great plan. Now Israel, they needed a lot of help because they had failed in every way as a kingdom of priests and the holy nation. They did not serve others. But in Jesus, God helped them fulfill their identity and purpose as his chosen people. So God did not fail. His scope was far greater than Abraham's descendants. His promise to Abraham was, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That includes us who are not his descendants by blood, but we are counted as God's people because of Jesus. God is faithful in his mercy in every generation. He carries out his purpose in our generation as well. He is calling us to make disciples of all nations on earth. Will he fail? Oh, you're not sure? Will he fail? Never. It includes a remnant of students on every campus in our homes. It is his promise. He will do it. Let's depend on his mercy. Let's look at verse 56. It's my last paragraph here. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. When you look at the last passage... Mary had heard the angel's greeting when Elizabeth was about six months pregnant. And it takes a while to get there, so maybe Elizabeth is now six or seven months pregnant when Mary shows up. And then she stayed three more months, likely until after John was born. Surely she must have helped and served Elizabeth in the delivery. But what an awesome view that was, because she got to see firsthand just what Gabriel had said. Nothing is impossible with God. She saw John the Baptist come out of old Elizabeth. Amazing. <laughs> really nice to see that. It'd be nice to stay with Elizabeth, actually. And just trust her tutelage. Just follow Elizabeth. Going home by herself? Ooh, that's very hard. But Mary did not stay with Elizabeth. She stepped out, boldly and courageously engaging God's calling and purpose for her life. She did so believing she was so blessed because God would fulfill his promises to her. Let's read verse 47 again. Mary's confession, okay? And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So, it's decision time. Do you want to be Mary, Mary, or melancholy? Let's not get distracted this season from the joy that should be ours in Jesus Christ. Let's remember his personal grace to us. He has been mindful of us. Let's remember his good character of mercy shown through his mighty arm. 
Let's remember his world redemptive plan that he has graciously included us in. And then we too may engage it courageously like Mary. May you compose many songs of joy like Mary. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Amen. Father, we are so thankful that you shared with us the inner world of Mary. She was so merry. She was so happy. She was so joyful. Her life, her inner person, magnified you, revealed you, brought you out. We want to experience this. And it's so easy for our perspective to become so narrow and self-focused. Lord Jesus, draw our eyes to you, to what you have done and who you are, and fill us with joy this Christmas time deep and abiding joy that comes from our deep soul like Mary had. May you bless us as we meditate on this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all rise and sing the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected.